Good morning. I'm Ichna Konstantinescu, the chair of the IRA, and uh, uh, I, I was uh, quite confused this morning because I didn't understand there are several uh, opinions what means to start uh, uh, at 8.30 sharp in Rome. From, uh, from one opinion means 8.30 sharp, from other opinions means 9 o'clock. But in any case, we gave uh, a chance to those uh, uh, who had to arrive here by taxi, by, by a cab to, to walk uh, uh, to, to this, uh, to this uh, beautiful uh, palace. And uh, I propose to start this uh, first panel of our conference um, um, uh, dedicated uh, to uh, the refugee policies from 1930s to 1945. I will give uh, the floor to our moderator for the uh, first panel, Father Norbert uh, Hoffman, uh, representing uh, the Holy See. Uh, who will introduce uh, the panelists and also uh, the, um, um, the, the theme that will be discussed during this morning. Father Hoffman, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Uh, it's, on, it's an honor for me to chair the first session. And as you know, the first session, it's the best to start with the beginning. <laughs> so... Um, Refugee policies from 1993 to 1945. Uh, every speaker has 20 minu minutes, one speaker after the other. I will introduce the speakers and then uh, have in mind you can have questions to the speakers after they, 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 their presentations. It's an honor for me to present, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Susanne Heim from the Institute of Contemporary History. She's living in Berlin. She's a German uh, political scientist and historian of National Socialism, the Holocaust, and inter international refugee policy. Since 2005, she has been uh, the project coordinator of the editorial project Judenverfolgung 1933 to 1945. Her publications include Architects of Annihilation, uh, and Fluchtpunkt Karibik, Jüdische Emigranten der Dominikanischen Republik. So we are happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for this kind introduction and also for being invited to this conference. Um, considering nowadays refugee numbers, it might seem rather strange that emigration from Germany after the Nazi assumption of power uh, was perceived as a refugee crisis. There were about 500,000 Jews living in Germany in 1933, and the majority of them didn't even take into consideration to leave the country. Confident that the Nazi government wouldn't survive longer than its predecessors during the Weimar Republic, and even uh, out of the estimated 60,000 who left Germany in 1933, the majority of them Jews, uh, many came back after a few weeks or months, having underestimated the difficulties of life in exile or because they had received comforting news convincing them uh, that the main blow was already over, more or less. Only 37,000, maybe have this first slide, please. Uh, only 37,000 decided to leave the country permanently in 1933, while during the following years, until the end of 1937, emigration figures were around 20, uh, 21 to 25,000 per year. In 1938, with the incorporation of Austria and the Sudeten, the number of Jews under German rule increased considerably, as did the pressure to emigrate. Some three quarters uh, of all Jews who fled Germany in 1933 went to other European countries, primarily to France, Czechoslovakia, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. 
As German citizens uh, didn't need a visa to enter the Netherlands and Switzerland, these two countries couldn't even control how many refugees entered their territory. However, in 1933, about 50% of those fleeing Germany didn't hold German citizenship, but were of Eastern European origin, although this, uh, their share in, uh, among the Jews in Germany was only about 20%, so the Eastern European Jews uh, were among the first who fled. Um, in France and in Belgium, Germans as well as Eastern, East Europeans needed a visa. In France, as a rule, all those who fled Germany were accepted as refugees in 1933, but were expected to leave uh, the country once the crisis was over. In Belgium, however, authorities were willing to accept only those who were considered to be useful immigrants, which means people with enough financial means to maintain themselves or with a specific qualification. Uh, those who were not considered to be useful were ordered to leave the country but were not directly expelled. Nevertheless, Belgian authorities executed considerable pressure to make them leave towards France or the Netherlands, a fact which increased diplomatic tensions between the neighboring countries. For the British government, it was much easier to maintain control over the territory and the entry of foreigners. Only a very lim limited number of about 300 uh, uh, foreigners per month were accepted, usually for no longer than two years. They had to prove that they had guaranteed means of livelihood and had to report to the pol police on a regular basis. Czechoslovakia was a preferred country of refuse for German intellectuals due to the country's German-influenced cultural environment, its vicinity to Germany, and its comparatively liberal immigration legislation. But apart from writers and journalists, refugees were prohibited, prohibited from employment, and it was virtually impossible to obtain a work permit. While initially refugees were received with compassion in the liberal European countries, the climate changed after it became obvious that the influx of refugees would not stop and they would not be able to return to Germany anytime soon. Due to the global depression and high unemployment rates, refugees were largely regarded as a problem for the labor market in most of the potential receiving countries. The liberalization of immigration policy was unpopular and opposed especially by the middle classes who feared the new arrivals as competitors. Consequently, uh, the first steps taken against them involved access to the job market. Before long, restrictive measures were ushered in that amounted to clamp down on the refugees' freedom of movement, political acti activities, and opportunities for long-term employment. Step by step, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Belgium introduced measures to ensure their control over, the, uh, over foreign labor, requiring work, work permits, or forcing peddlers to apply for a license. The Belgian government was especially keen to abolish the 19th century legislation according to which immigrants who had resided in the country and had been employed for a while could not be expelled even if they became unemployed and even worse, they were entitled to receive welfare money. So let me a little bit summarize the, uh, the responses of, inter of the uh, European countries on the internal level. Like today, most countries reacted according to what they considered to be their national interest, defending the internal labor market and economy against newcomers. The measures introduced had one overarching rationale, to stop or at least to curb undesired immigration as quickly as possible. However, usually authorities refrained from sending refugees back to Germany, but sending them to the neighboring countries 
once they had managed to escape. But there was also um, another level of reaction, the international one. Um, although, it might be worry, uh, although they might be worried about the political situation in Germany, most European governments didn't want to get in serious trouble with the, with the powerful Germans. Let me give one example. In the preliminary discussions, which finally led to the establishment of the High Commissioner of the League of Nations for Refugees coming from Germany, it became very obvious throughout the year 1933 that no country pushed for the creation of a new institution because such a step might have offended the German government. At length, reluctantly, uh, the Dutch government took the initiative to su suggest the foundation of a High Commissioner, all the while stressing repeatedly in front of the Germans that this should not be seen as a criticism of Germany, but was a pure measure of self-defense. Uh, from the documents of a for a German Foreign Office, we can learn that the Germans at that stage were still comparatively sensitive to criticism from abroad. But the individual and nationalist reactions at the League's member states even encouraged the Germans in their rather arrogant and self-righteous attitude that their policy of forced migration was legitimate while other countries had to cope with the consequences, that is, with the, refu with the refugees. Uh, the fact that no one wanted to confront the Germans led to a compromise that debilitated the High Commissioner's office from the outset. It was uh, not responsible uh, to the General Assembly of the, uh, Assembly of the League, but to a governing body uh, of representatives from interested nations, uh, and thus had little influence. And it did not even uh, receive a, f a formal budget from the League of Nations. The United States were not a member of the League, but sent a representative to the governing body. And the new High Commissioner, James MacDonald, was a US citizen. Nevertheless, the US administration missed no opportunity to make clear that it didn't back MacDonald in his efforts to find settlement opportunities for refugees and thus weakened his position even more. All this was carefully observed in the German Foreign Office and commented gleefully. Immigration into the US was limited, so uh, maybe have the next slide please, uh, was limited by a quota system. According to this, no more than 25,000 Germans were allowed to enter the States per year. However, although many thousands uh, wanted to leave Europe for America, apart from the year 1939, as you can see, the quota was never filled. The reason for this was the so-called LPC clause, the clause uh, likely to become a public charge that barred any person from immigration to the US who might be likely to become a public charge. But the decision how much money an immigrant had to own in order to not to be considered as a potential public charge was left completely up to the consuls. So this was no matter of law also, but a matter of atmosphere and consideration. And this left the visa applicants in a completely insecure situation. After 1933, the US Labor Ministry pushed for liberalizing the immigration rules, at least for those foreigners who had close relatives in the United States, able and willing to provide financial support for them. However, opposition in the State Department, as well as in large parts of the American society, turned out to be stronger. Even many of those who wanted to support the refugees were worried uh, that large numbers of incoming Jews might add fuel to the general anti-immigrant sentiment. Such concerns were widespread among Amer American Jews as well and influenced their views on how many and which refugees would be welcome, preferably those who spoke English and had a chance uh, of finding employment in the near future and thus were not dependent on relief, 
and those uh, who were not visibly being religiously observant, so no orthodox, uh, no orthodox Jews. The American uh, Federation of Labor, although taking a firm stand against the Nazi uh, government and backed the anti-Nazi bo boycott, stood resolutely against loosening immigration laws. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt did not interfere in this debate, at least not publicly, as he did not want to alienate either side. He even avoided to condemn the Nazi policy of persecution in these years, claiming this to be an internal German affair. Next slide, please. In March 1938, after the so-called Anschluss, the annexation of Austria to the German Reich, and the attendant pogroms, refugee numbers skyrocketed. Uh, on the European level, the situation was aggravated further by the fact that some countries, such as Poland, Romania, Hungary, and Yugoslavia too, executed rather strong pressure upon their Jewish minorities to make them leave the country. Uh, so the German uh, example uh, formed also a precedent. Uh, as a consequence of the increasing refugee numbers, uh, President Roosevelt initiated, as we have heard yesterday from Ambassador Constantinescu, initiated in, an international conference at Evian in France in July 1938, which turned out to be more or less a complete failure. So next slide, please. This is uh, a photo of, of a conference, and you see uh, MacDonald in the middle si uh, sitting down under this paper of the um, lecturer. Um, the de uh, delegates uh, of tw 32 states expressed their compassion with the refugees, but one after the other declared that their country could not absorb more refugees. But what aggravated the situation was the fact uh, that the refugees from Germany, before leaving the country, were bereaved of their belongings throughout a sophisticated system of taxes, fees, and tributes. This impeded their establishment in exile and indeed made them likely to become a public charge. The countries participating in the conference were confronted with a fundamental dilemma. If they refused to accept indigent refugees, they were leaving them to German anti-Jewish persecution. If, on the other hand, they declared themselves willing to accept refugees even without concessions from the German side regarding the refugees' assets, they were in effect aiding and abetting the expulsion of Jews possibly not only from Germany, but from Poland, Romania, and other countries as well. The Germans reclaimed the right not, to not only to exclude foreigners from the German territory, but also to de declare that sections of their own national population being not of German blood and thus, thus not part of the ethnic community. As long as the countries of refuge did not want to go into open confrontation with the Nazi state, they could only try to deal with the consequences of the Nazi redefinition of the ethnic community. Those countries most if, uh, affected by the refugee uh, influx after the conference uh, of Evian um, started to close down their borders, so the conference initiated a uh, kind of a chain reaction uh, making obvious that no one was willing to accept large numbers of destitute refugees. Next slide, please. For a brief uh, moment after the pogroms of November, the so-called Kristallnacht, this tendency seemed to reverse. In Great Britain, um, oh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, in Great Britain, um, the public was alarmed uh, by, uh, by the news about the pogrom, which made the famous Kindertransport initiative possible. 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, Austria, and soon after from Czechoslovakia as well, were brought to, the, uh, to Britain and placed in refugee camps 
or foster families. In addition to Britain, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Belgium, and Sweden uh, took in large numbers of Jewish children as well. But this turned out to be an exception. Over the course of 1938, and particularly after November, flight became more difficult and more chaotic, forcing those who attempted to flee to take illegal and often dangerous routes out of the country or to pay huge amounts uh, of money to traffickers. Correspondingly, competition for the uh, few remaining possibilities for official immigration intensified, as did pressure from the Gestapo in their efforts to force the remaining Jews out of the country. In the countries of refuge, uh, consuls were well as, uh, as well as border guards were instructed to do whatever possible to keep Jews out of the respective country. U.S. consuls in Germany and Austria were ordered to assess the applicants' moral and financial standing and often discouraged potential applicants from applying in the first place. Uh, the U.S. government, which even at the Conference of Avion had declined to change the restrictive immigration regulations, was guided by internal, politi uh, internal political climate. Uh, President Roosevelt was preparing his campaign for a third term in office, and public opinion polls had shown clearly that, vast, uh, that the vast majority of American voters opposed the loosening of immigration uh, policy. Um, in many European countries, refugee organizations, which had carried the main financial and administrative burden to feed and house refugees, reached their limits. Increasingly, refugees were put in, uh, into camps, partly due to the lack of housing, partly also in order to keep the unwanted newcomers away from the public sphere or, and make them thus kind of uh, invisible. When the war broke out, these camps turned into instruments of detention and many of the refugees into so-called enemy aliens. Border control was not only a matter of immigration policy, but a question of security now too. In the US, the administration argued that Nazi spies might get smuggled into the country in, guise, in the guise of refugees long before the country entered the war. In June 1941, the State Department prepared a regulation which would deny a visa to any immigrant who had close relatives in occupied Europe, which was actually everybody. Uh, before the new regulation could be implemented, the American consulates in German-occupied countries closed down anyway in mid-July 1941. Uh, in October 1941, it was the German Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler who prohibited all Jewish immigration with regard to the deportations and the so-called final solution. So what can be learned from the refugee crisis of the 1930s? Let me summarize the responses of Europe and the US. Uh, the reaction uh, of the European state uh, lacked any kind of solidarity among each other. They were rather short-sighted and nationalistic, defending control over one's own territory and economy. By doing so, they left the initiative to the Germans, who forced the Jews to leave the country penniless, and the neighboring states to deal with them, or all uh, states of, uh, who received uh, refugees. But the failure to solve the refugee crisis even damaged the democratic, uh, democratic substance of the uh, European nations and the US. By militarizing their borders, forcing refugees to take illegal and dangerous routes, treating them as criminals and establishing camps which turned into prisons, the democratic countries increasingly adopted totalitarian methods without regaining the political initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heim, for your remarks.
uh, about the policy in Europe and the United States regarding the refugee crisis uh, starting in 1933, taking over in the country uh, German refugees. Um, the next speaker, I know for a long time, uh, he is presenting uh, the attitude, the actions uh, of the Holy See regarding this refugee crisis. It's, uh, I'm presenting to you Dr. Johann X from the Holy See. He's a studied religious science, he studied religious sciences, theology and philosophy at the Catholic University of Leuven and got his doctorate in church history at the Pontificia Universita Gregoriana. He worked as academic assistant of the Archivum Historie Pontificae, official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and official and archivist of the Tribunal of the Apostolic Penitentiary. Currently, he is head of the Historical Archive section for relations with states of the Secretary of State. He published on several subjects related to the history of the Church in the Middle Ages and in the 19th and 20th century. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> the, paper, the presentation will focus on the work of the Holy See as an international body, and therefore of the Catholic Church in respect of refugees in the 30s and the 40s. I will leave out the 30s because, uh, of course, we have little time, 20 minutes, and um, concentrate on the second part, uh, the 40s onwards. However, it is important to underline that any humanitarian effort requires an agreement, often arrived through diplomatic channels with civilian authorities. And for the 30s and the 40s, it's important to mention that the conditions of the Holy See changed compared to World War I and its aftermath. While in 1929, with the Lateran Treaty, the international position of the Holy See had been codified. And this new situation helped, on one hand, to distinguish the Holy See, its territories and its actions on the international level from that from Italy. And on the, other, on the other hand, it made it possible to the Holy See to act independently. And the creation of Vatican Radio, for instance, and postal and telegraphic services would show themselves most useful to pursue part of the pontiff's charity during the war. Another difference with the refugee issue of the Holy See during World War I was the codification of the right of war prisoners and those of detained civilians by the conventions of the International Red Cross of Geneva in 1929 and those of Tokyo in 1934. I skip the 30s, uh, the help of during the civil war in Spain, uh, where the church was uh, involved for at least estimated 3 million refugees that uh, were uh, let's say, in danger, and also the repatriation afterwards of Spanish refugees in France. Anyway, when we talk uh, about the efforts of, when we want to talk about the efforts of the Holy See in favor of those Jewish refugees, we have to make a clear distinction between the defense and prevention that the Holy See already developed in the, on the ideological level and the concrete actions later on the material and spiritual level during the war. Indeed, the Holy See sought already in the 30s to confine in a preventive way the racist ideologies of National Socialism. Pius XI and his Secretary of State Eugenio Pacelli were much better informed about the paganist spirit and that inspired Hitler's Third Reich than usually taught and said New archival seri series called uh, Scatola Bianche, the white boxes, that were recently opened to the public, revealed that they were almost daily informed about the political situation in Germany. And furthermore, other new archival collections called International Organizations that we opened in October reflects how little sympathy, I would rather say total aversion, Pope XI and his administration had towards the National Socialist ideology. I skip to the Holy See and World War II. 
Although Pius XII in his radio message of 24th August 39 still uses general diplomatic terminology warning the nations that the danger is imminent, but there is still time, nothing is lost with peace, but all can be lost with the war, it would soon be clear, clear with more than half of Europe occupied in less than half a year, that the situation of the refugees was becoming critical, and it was becoming very difficult, if not sometimes impossible, as we heard already, to help them. Borders were closed, neutral countries were increasing sophisticated bureaucratic obstacles to refuse refugees entry or even passage through the national territory. The delay caused by this bureaucratically curtain would mean a sure death sentence for thousands of Jews all over Europe. Also for the Polish forced workers deported in Germany and the Polish people under German occupation, the Holy See could not intervene. While the Nazis fooled the whole international community, organizing fake concentration camps that were to visit, even the International Committee of the Red Cross was not allowed to visit the real concentration camps, not even in the last years of the war. The same was the case for the Polish deported to Siberia by the Russians, two million people in one time. It was considered an internal affair Moscow and Berlin did not show the slightest respect for the international agreements on soldiers in captivity. Others did observe the regulation. The deportations, after being initiated in Australia and Germany itself, started, of course, we heard it already, Slovakia, Croatia, France, Belgium, and Holland. And it is in this perspective that the humanitarian, humanitarian, humanitarian help of the Holy See was being developed at its full extension and power during these years of World War II. August 1st, Pius XII of 1941 averted on Vatican Radio a great scandal is presently taking place and this scandal is the treatment suffered by the Jews. That is why I desire that a free voice, the voice of a priest, should be raised in protest. In Germany, the Jews are killed, so says the Pope, brutalized, tortured, because they are victims uh, bereft of, def of defense. How can a Christian such deeds accept such deeds? These men are the sons of those who 2,000 years ago gave Christianity to the world. These were the words of the pontiff <clears throat> by the time of the Wednesday conference, of course, on 20th January 42, that officially approved the total extermination of the Jewish people. Who are then the agents of assistance for the Holy See? To answer to this question, one could differentiate the problem of the refugees according to a geographical hierarchy. The first level would be the international one, the second, the regional or national, and the third, Rome and the Vatican itself. On the international level, the first level, the main actors for humanitarian assistance were in the first place the diplomatic representatives of the Pope. It was already indicated that the most active nuncios and pontifical delegates were the following, and I really want to mention them all. Turkey and Greece, Angelo Roncalli, Apostolic Delegate. Berlin, Monsignor Cesare Or Orsenigo, Nuncio. Bern, Pietro Bernardini, Nuncio. Budapest, Monsignor Angelo Rotta, Nuncio. Bratislava, Xaverius Ritter, Nuncio. Bucharest, Monsignor Andrea Casullo, o Casulo, Nuncio. Lisbon, Monsignor Pietro Ciriaci, Nuncio. London, Monsignor William Geoffrey, Apostolic Delegate, Madrid, the, uh, of 38 on, Gaetano Cicognani, Nuncio, Rome, Monsignor Francesco Borgongini Duca, Nuncio, mm. France, Monsignor Valerio Valeri, Nuncio, and from December 44, Monsignor Angelo Roncalli, Washington, Monsignor Amleto Giovanni Cicognani, and last but not least, I have to mention the apostolic visitor, the abbot Marcone, 
uh, apostolic visitor to the Croatian bishops in Zagreb. I give the list. Three of them are already among the writers among the nations recognized by Yad Vashem. I think others deserve the same, but uh, Yad Vashem should think about that. Um, <clears throat> We already pointed out on the choice of the abbot Marcone, which was very curious, chosen by Pacelli and Cardinal uh, Maliona, Secretary of State, as a representative for the Holy See for Yugoslavia, he was a very interesting choice. Indeed, appointing persons with no diplomatic training or experience at all, but dotted by their activities inclined to save and protect Jews, could shed a light on the nomination policy of the Holy See in that region or for that region in Europe. All of these churchmen were inclined to save Jews, and they did, without fear in the face of Nazi and fascist terror. Sharing the same conviction, they formed a discreet but most efficient network. I pass to the seven to the second level, the national and the regional level. Of course, on the Italian level, we have bishops and dioceses in the dioceses that are working also with Rome. The immigration of Jews escaping from the persecution in Germany and occupied zones was blocked on the borders of Italy. On the other hand, the Italian government had a policy, at least for a few years, of non-deportation and did not hand over Jews who were already residing within the national borders. The Jews who escaped from Croatia towards the coast occupied by Italy remained uncertain. Until 41, the papal nuncio in Italy, at least for the Catholic Jews in the camps, was able to intervene. And also the Jesuit father, Tacchi Venturi, who was the go-between, the political go-between between Mussolini and Pacelli, uh, Pope Pacelli, tried to intervene, sometimes in vain, it's true, but at the highest political level, he gained also some favors for the Jewish refugees and the Jewish people living in Italy. Then Rome and the Vatican. The same studies teach us more about the existence of a network that was active in Rome and the Vatican and surrounded it. Supported and organized by different priests and religious of different nationalities. The most known of them is of course the Irishman Hugo Flaherty, living in the college of the Campo Santo Teutonico inside the Vatican, which was a nest of anti-Nazism. He was helped by the Austrian Monsignor Alois Hudal, a rector of the Teutonic Institute of the College of Santa Maria dell'Anima, and the Swiss father Pancratius Pfeiffer, Salvatorian, and the Dutch father Anselmus Muster, who this uh, Anselmus Muster, who was arrested in 1944 on the steps of Santa Maria Maggiore, imprisoned and brutally tortured by the Gestapo in Via Tasso but never betraying the Roman escape line and its members. It was clear that O'Flaherty was using these Jews um, that were in danger and that the contacts and conversations with those in need of help took place in his office and on the first floor of the Holy Office, Palace of the Inquisition inside the Vatican. The Roman escape line would have saved about 6,000 people of all different nationalities. As I pointed out previously, already 10 years ago, all evidence points out, in fact, to the Holy Office as a key role player. In October 43, an important agreement was gained between the Germans and the Holy See, or I must say, between the Holy See and Germany. Whereby the, uh, whereby the Vatican and its buildings outside the Vatican property were granted neutral status, and therefore protection from German intrusion was assured. Almost 5,000 Roman Jews took advantage of this situation to seek shelter in the Vatican and its buildings and in convents and monasteries of Rome. Countless others were saved in convents and monasteries spread all over Italy. A statistic study accurately effectuated by Oversteins showed that in Rome there were about 13,500 
uh, 81 Jews. At the moment, the Nazis took command of the city. A command was given for the deportation of 8,000 Jews officially registered. The other group of 5,581 were refugees who escaped from Germany, Poland, and other Nazi Germany occupied zones. Of those total uh, number, 13,581, a number or of at least 2,091, mainly Jewish residents in Rome, were deported to concentration camps. This means that about 11,581 Jews survived somehow in Rome. We report the numbers that Overstein was able to, to reconstruct until now. Out of these 11,581 Jews, about 4,479 found hiding places in 218 monasteries. The monasteries in Rome were constantly under pressure of possible roundups, razias. During the Nazi occupation of Rome every week, some of the monasteries were object, object of Nazi intrusion. 3,000 Jews found shelter in Castel Gandolfo, the, pa the Pope's palace outside Rome. 1,732 were under protection of De La Zem in collaboration with the Holy See, hidden in 400 private apartments and houses in Rome, all of them property of Switzerland with diplomatic protection. The Palatine Guard in the Vatican took 400, 410 Jews in service and the statistics of Oversteins give a number of 40 Jews hidden in the Vatican itself on, 4 June, on the 4th of June, 1943. In the extraterritorial properties of the Vatican, about 460 Jews were hidden. Of those, 108 were already identified today, and about 1,460 survived the war, living in private houses, mostly of befriended Catholic families, cardinals, or parish infrastructures. Andrea Riccardi was able to describe the story, at least, of 365 of those people. Beyond this very complex organization of aid on, on the bilateral and international level, a particular intense humanitarian activity was developed, in fact, also inside the city of Rome and around it. And of this aid, the archives of the Secretary of State, but particularly those of the Governato of the Vatican City State, will give some surprising evidence when they will be opened. The situation in and around the city became most critical, in particular after the bombings of 19 July and 13 August 43. The bombardments that followed avoided hitting the center of the city, but focused on the villages and the means of communications in the surroundings of the city. And moreover, due to the war actions, 70,000 refugees most of them coming from the region of Cassino. The white-yellow cars that crossed the roads of the Umbria, Marche and Toscana were themselves in continuous dangers. danger. It were cars, of course, of the uh, Holy See. Many of them were captured or fell victim to war actions. Even Monsignor Baldelli, who was the organizer of this operation, was captured and kept prisoner for several days. Their captivity was double. On the one hand, uh, their activity, excuse me, was double. On the one hand, they should provide food for the inhabitants of Rome and surroundings. And on the other hand, take care of the immense problem of refugees directed to Rome. And how was that situation at the end of the war in Rome? Around Rome, there were refugee camps all over the place. Campo Breda, at 15 kilometers of the, at the Via Casellina. There, refugees were welcomed in a structure that was in continuous danger, that lacked hygienic measures with the danger of contamination. The Pope's charity, in the first place, was for orphans and dispersed persons. They were taken to other institutes out of this camp, like so the Institute of the uh, San Gregorio Alcelio, uh, that was under constant dispute by the police and German forces. Il Campo di Cesano, outside Rome, there were 20,000 refugees gathered. Pius XII, uh, we know that because at Eastern, 
uh, of uh, 44 Pius XII sent 25,000 eggs uh, to this camp to feed the people. And those were distributed in the midst of a bombardment in which four people were killed and many injured. injured. Castelli Romani, the papal assistant counted 70,000 refugees in the area of the Castelli Romani. Also in Lanuvio, the people ate grass for nutrition. In Velletri, 2,000 refugees hide out in the caves, being cut off of any provision of salt, flour, and other nutrition. Genzano population, a little village outside Rome also, was reduced to 1,000 people, incapacitated and poor. To all these little cities and villages, the papal assistants convent floor, flour, money, and medications. The places used as stores were kept secret. There was an absolute silence about, among everyone on these places and those who were helping them. Although always promised, no list whatsoever of their location was handed over to the occupying forces of Rome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. X, for your remarks. It's really astonishing what the Holy See did in this, during this refugee crisis. And uh, now I will introduce to you the third speaker. He will speak about the reactions of NGOs and international organizations. I um, introduce to you Professor Dr. Avinu Ampat. He is the Philip uh, Feldman Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford, where he is also director of the Museum of Jewish Civilization. His first book, Finding Home and Homeland, Jewish Youth and Zionism in the Aftermath of the Holocaust, examines the appeal of Zionism for young survivors in Europe in the aftermath of the Holocaust and their role in the creation of the State of Israel. He is also the co-editor of a collected volume on Jewish displaced persons titled We Are Here, New Approaches to the Study of Jewish Displaced Persons in the Post-War Germany. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Ira and the Holy See for organizing today's conference and to the conference organizers for inviting me to participate. Before we begin, uh, I'm mindful of the difficulties of making historical or exact historical comparisons between the 1930s and 40s and the present day situation. But I'd like to suggest that one parallel may we, we may want to consider is from the perspective of the refugees and the impact of the experience of statelessness on subsequent political actions and behavior. The Nazi rise to power in 1933, followed by the anti-Semitic discriminatory legislation that sought to remove German Jews from economic, social, and cultural life, created a refugee crisis that the international community was ill-equipped to handle. Between 1933 and 1939, while over half of Germany's approximately 500,000 Jews were able to emigrate to other countries, attempts to develop an effective international response through the Evian Conference, the creation of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, the organization of the Kinder Transport, and more, failed to reach a comprehensive solution creating a sense among the Nazi leadership that the international community cared little for the fate of Jews under Nazi domination. As we've heard, the Anschluss uh, in Austria, occupation of Czechoslovakia, and then the outbreak of World War II created a refugee crisis of even greater scale that individual Jews and Jewish communities in Europe, Jewish social welfare organizations, and the Allies scrambled to address. Once again, belated attempts to respond, such as the Bermuda Conference of April 1943 and the creation of the War Refugee Board, failed to address a crisis of unprecedented magnitude. And again, in the aftermath of World War II, Allied armies and UNRWA were ill-equipped to address the post-war Jewish refugee crisis. From the perspective of individual Jews and Jewish organizations, the perceived abandonment of the Jews by the international community 
before, during, and after World War II had significant political and diplomatic ramifications that would alter the course of post-war history, particularly with key diplomatic decisions leading to the creation of the State of Israel. Both during and after the war, survivors and refugees carried the lessons of their displacement, developing a vocal and independent political structure to advocate for themselves. As my colleagues in the next session will focus on the post-war period, I will devote my remarks here specifically to the period from 1933 to 1945. And as the time is limited, I'd like to consider three distinct episodes from the time period with a focus on the responses of Jewish organizations, Jewish communities, and Jewish refugees. Let's go to the slide of the Evian Conference. Following the Evian Conference convened by FDR, in response to mounting political pressure on the refugee situation in early July 1938. You can go one more. Similar, ah, the same picture of Myron Taylor. Uh, and the creation of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees. The German government was able to state how astounding it was that foreign countries criticized Germany for its treatment of the Jews, yet none of them opened their doors. With governments and international bodies unable to respond, it often fell to NGOs and individual actors on the ground to fill the vacuum. In late October 1938, the Nazi regime expelled 16,000 Polish Jews from Germany, dumping them across the border into the Polish town of Zvonshin. The Polish authorities refused to admit these expellees, and the town became an ad hoc refugee camp. Among those Polish Jews stranded in between the two countries were the parents and siblings of a young man named Herschel Grinspan, who was so distraught over what he heard that he assassinated a German diplomat in Paris in protest, providing a pretext for what would become known as Kristallnacht. While Kristallnacht would immediately seize the attention of the world, the fate of thousands of Jewish refugees stranded in Zbanshin fell to Polish Jewish welfare organizations. In this case, the Warsaw Office of the American Joint Distribution Committee, or JDC, TOZ, the Society for the Protection of the Health of the Jewish Population in Poland, and CENTOS, a Polish Jewish organization that cared for orphans and children, which quickly sprang into action. Within weeks, Polish Jews had raised 3.5 million zlotys, which was the equivalent of about 700,000 US dollars in 1938 for aid of their Jewish brethren. Among those who coordinated the relief efforts in Zmanshin were Emanuel Ringelblum, later to become known as the historian of the Warsaw Ghetto, and Yitzhak Gitterman, also from the joint, who died in Warsaw in 1943. Ringelblum detailed the relief efforts in a letter to a friend, the Polish Jewish historian Rafael Mahler, on December, in December of 1938, after working in Zvanshin for about five weeks. As he wrote, I think there has never been so ferocious, so pitiless a deportation of any Jewish community in this German deportation. He detailed the creation of a fully functioning township for the 16,000 refugees in Zbanshim. As he wrote, the most important thing is that this is not a situation where some give and some receive. The refugees look on us as brothers who have hurried to help them at a time of distress and tragedy. Almost all the responsible jobs are carried out by refugees. The warmest and most friendly relations exist between us and the refugees. Detailing cultural and educational efforts in the refugee camp, Ringelblum concluded nonetheless with this observation. Zbanshin has become a symbol for the defenselessness of the Jews of Poland. Jews were humiliated to the level of lepers, to citizens of third class, and a result, we were all visited by terrible tragedy. Zbanshin was a heavy moral blow against the Jewish population of Poland, and it is for this reason that all threads lead from the Jewish masses to Banshin and to the Jews who suffer there. Even after Kristallnacht, which would be widely reported in graphic detail, while the kinder transport would lead to the immigration of 10,000 children to England, and some individual efforts proved successful, Americans remained reluctant to welcome Jewish refugees, and the quotas, as we've heard discussed, remained in place. 
the plight of the St. Louis has been well documented, and the Wagner Rogers Bill, an effort to admit 20,000 endangered Jewish refugee children, was not supported by the Senate in 1939 and 1940. Widespread racial prejudices among Americans, including anti Semitic attitudes held by U.S. State Department officials, played a part in the failure to admit more refugees. Thus, it would fall to aid organizations, such as the Joint Distribution Committee and the World Jewish Congress, to provide relief to Jews when the next massive refugee crisis would unfold. Since its founding in 1914 to respond to the crisis confronting Jews in the Ottoman Empire and then in Europe during the First World War, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee had been the foremost Jewish relief organization raising and distributing funds to Jewish communities in need around the world. The key to JDC's success, however, was not only American fundraising efforts, it was a dedicated cadre of relief workers on the ground embedded in local communities that made the organization work, along with the policy of empowering individual aid recipients in the work of the organization. New political developments in the summer of 1939, portending the imminence of war, forced JDC leaders to realign their budget priorities. The beginning of the war created a whole new set of political and financial challenges. In the war zone, Jewish organizations struggled to coordinate their response to the overwhelming demands for help. As Yehuda Bauer's research has shown, in the first weeks of the war, when Poland was effectively cut off from the rest of the world, the independence and resourcefulness of the Warsaw office proved crucial in organizing relief on the ground without waiting for directions from New York. And unlike many prominent Jewish leaders from Warsaw who fled in the front of the German onslaught, Ringelblum and his circle decided to stay in Poland. Their, their efforts were tremendous at the beginning of the war, but I'll just summarize some of the JDC's efforts, what they accomplished during the war. By the end of 1939, JDC and their organizations had helped 110,000 Jews to emigrate from Germany, 30,000 in 1939 alone. In 1940, the joint was helping refugees in transit in more than 40 countries. And from the outbreak of World War II through 1944, JDC enabled over 81,000 Jews to emigrate. From its wartime headquarters in Lisbon, JDC chartered ships and continued to help thousands of refugees escape from Europe through various routes. In France, they uh, aided legal and illegal organizations. They smuggled funds to help some 7,000 Jewish children in hiding, as well in Switzerland, as well as in Spain, in Shanghai, in Tehran and elsewhere, relief programs aided refugees in transit. When the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939, an even greater humanitarian crisis, let's go back to the previous picture, unfold, rapidly unfolded. Lithuania, which had been occupied by the Soviet Union, henceforth became the main immediate destination for Jewish refugees from Poland. Vilna now became the capital of the Lithuanian state, although it was still possible to move freely between Vilna and the eastern part of Poland for about two months. Many Polish Jews took advantage of this opportunity and fled for the city, finding Vilna appealing, not only as possibly the only remaining way out of Poland, but also as the long-standing center of a vibrant Jewish culture with a well-established Jewish community and infrastructure. According to one refugee, at first instinctively and spontaneously, and then in an organized way, masses of Jews streamed to Vilna. Trains leaving for Vilna were overcrowded. The number of Polish Jewish refugees in Vilna eventually reached about 14,000, according to JDC data. Writing a year after the fact, the Polish Jewish Bundist Hermann Kruk documented the early days of refugee life in Vilna. The hundreds and thousands who arrived in Vilna were huddled together, terrified, hungry, and exhausted. A week ago, a landlord, the director of a bank, an industrialist, today, hungry, naked, and hunched up. 10 days ago, a merchant, a factory supervisor, a cobbler, a baker, today, na naked and barefoot, crushed. Thousands of Jewish refugees from Poland depended on Jewish humanitarian aid for survival in their new places of residence until the Soviets outlawed uh, foreign aid organizations at the end of 1940. 
As Moshe Kleinbaum detailed in a letter to Nachum Goldman of the World Jewish Congress, even though the lot is better than that of the other three million or unfortunate Polish Jews, there is scarcely any possibility for emigration. Apart from the lack of immigration countries, there is hardly any means of transportation out of Lithuania. Consequently, we must reckon with the fact that the majority of the Jewish refugees must remain in Lithuania for a long time. While refugees in Lithuania depended on aid to survive, it quickly became clear that the various relief organizations were ill-equipped to work together. Disagreements persisted, war and the refugee crisis in Vilna did not resolve long-standing differences in political outlook between Jewish socialists, Zionists, and religious leaders. Conflicts and repetition of efforts among the organizations active in Vilna was a constant, as the JDC, organizations connected to Hayas, the Lithuanian Jewish Committee of the Red Cross, and the World Jewish Congress struggled to unite relief efforts. Despite the numerous challenges and obstacles facing Jewish refugees, some did manage to escape, thanks to the assistance of principal diplomats who defied travel bans and obstacles to help refugees. Chiyun Sugihara was a Japanese diplomat, a vice consul of the Empire of Japan in Kovno, when the war broke out. Risking his political career, he granted Japanese transit visas to Jewish refugees stranded in Lithuania against the rules set by the Japanese government, thereby saving thousands of people. Other diplomats like Jan Zwardendik and Kovno in this period undertook similar risks. Refugees such as Samuel Stoltz were thus able to leave Lithuania and travel east, hoping to escape from the Nazi reach. Stamps, which you can see here in Samuel's nationality certificate, in effect his passport, let's go back for a second, illustrate his path from Bialystok via Kovno to Japan, China, India, and finally Palestine. One point that becomes clear in this case, however, is how ill-equipped Jewish organizations in America and Palestine were to confront an unprecedented crisis of such scale. Who would take the lead? American Jews or the Yishuv in Palestine. Jewish organizations and communities in the United States and the Yishuv suffered from internal divisions and divergent goals in the pre-war period. There was no unified American Jewish community to speak of in the 1930s, and thus a communal base for unified action did not exist. At the same time, the leaders of the Yishuv did not appear to be in a position to provide central coordination in the relief effort due to their distance from war-torn Europe, their own preoccupation with future settlement in Palestine, and internal divisions over the best course of action. Jewish organizations whose resources were already stretched by the depression and the refugee crisis of the 1930s now grappled with the humanitarian crisis rendered all the more complex by the politics of the war. The JDC found itself at odds with the relative newcomers from the World Jewish Congress. Throughout the war, the JDC and the World Jewish Congress remained, to, according to Yehuda Bauer, enemies. The word is not too strong. The overlap in the work of these two organizations proved to be an insurmountable obstacle, and for the entire duration of the war, they never cooperated in a serious way. And now to the third episode. All of these efforts were a drop in the bucket as the war expanded and the scope of the Nazi policy of annihilation or the final solution became clear, especially at the end of 1942 and into 1943. Before the outbreak of fighting in the Warsaw Ghetto on April 19, 1943, the other major news item that captured the attention of the world Jewish press was the ill-fated Bermuda Conference, convened in response to urgent demands to rescue what was left of European Jewry. On January 20th, 1943, the British Foreign Office, in response to public pressure from Parliament, humanitarian organizations, and the Church, especially as the Regner telegram had been publicized and the scope of the final solution became more widely known, proposed British and American consultation to come up with a possible solution to the crisis. The result was the Anglo-American Conference on Refugees held in Bermuda from April 19th to the 30th, 1943. Consultations at the conference, which would ultimately prove ineffective, attracted a good deal of attention in the Jewish press in late April of 1943. 
Even at the conference, Jewish organizations were not invited to attend, reinforcing a sense of powerlessness and impotence on the part of world Jewry to make a dent in the apathy of the world. Much of the time at Bermuda was spent debating whether it was even appropriate to refer to Jews as the Nazis' primary victims. Jews in the free world could lobby their political leaders, but the ability to rescue and engage in acts of retribution or offensive military action were non-existent. Both Dr. Harold Dodds, head of the American delegation, and Richard Law, head of the British delegation, indicated that, quote, the solution to the refugee problem lies in an allied victory. Aid to refugees would be considered secondary to military efforts, and no plan would be considered by the delegates which could be constructed in any way as tending to retard the war effort. When the report of the Bermuda Conference was published seven months later on December 10, 1943, the only positive suggestion was to restart the Evian Committee, too late to engage in any effective rescue efforts. Unable to participate at the conference itself, the majority of American Jewish organizations, represented by the Joint Emergency Committee for European Jewish Affairs, made the text of their appeal sent to the conference public through the press. And I'll quote here. We would be less than frank if we did not convey to you the anguish of the Jewish community of this country over the failure of the United Nations to act until now to rescue the Jews of Europe. For many months, it has been authenticated the Nazis have marked the Jewish population of Europe for total extermination, and that it is estimated that almost three million Jews have been done to death, while a similar fate awaits those who remain. World civilization has been stirred to its depths by these horrors. Every section of public opinion throughout the world, and more particularly in England and the United States, has spoken out in demand that the United Nations act before it is too late to save those who can still be saved. Six months have elapsed, however, and no action has as yet been taken. In the meantime, it is reported that thousands of Jews continue to be murdered daily. As the Jewish press reported on the deliberations at the Bermuda Conference, it is safe to say that the rather limited scope of the discussions and the self-imposed boundaries on the delegates only contributed to a sense that, the world, that world Jewry was largely powerless and that democracy had failed in its obligation to protect the Jewish min minority. As the Jewish Frontier, a labor Zionist newspaper in the United States, noted in an editorial in May of 1943, titled The Gentleman at Bermuda, Hitler has won another victory at Bermuda a moral political victory in which Nazidom rejoices. The so-called refugee conference has made a mockery, not only of the agony of millions of helpless human beings, but of the great cause of liberation to which the democratic world is committed and which alone makes the horror of our time understandable and endurable. Thus, even though protests and mobilized action of Jewish groups eventually led to the creation of the War Refugee Board on January 22, 1944, after World War II, the, the board's first director, John Peel, described the board as, quote, little and late. The board's work has, however, been credited with saving as many as 200,000 lives during the Holocaust. Even so, the perceived failure of the international community to address the Jewish refugee crisis before and during the war sets the backdrop for solutions that would emerge after the war for the Jewish displaced persons, civilians who because of the war were living outside the boundaries of his or her country and who wanted to but could not return home or find a new home without assistance. Given the inability of the international system of citizenship to address the problem of Jewish statelessness during and after the war, it should not surprise us that Earl Harrison's famous report came to conclusions that the best way to solve the statelessness of the Jewish DP population through immigration to Palestine linked the post-war Jewish refugee crisis with the eventual establishment of the State of Israel. In conclusion, he wrote in the report, I wish to repeat that the main solution, in many ways the only real solution of the problem, lies in the quick evacuation of all non-repatriable Jews in Germany and Austria who wish it to Palestine. After 12 years of displacement, struggle, and flight, it is unsurprising too that the majority of Jewish DPs would also embrace Zionism, a Zionism that addressed their abandonment, their need for independence, and a solution to their displacement as a collective solution to the Jewish refugee crisis.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pat, for your remarks. And thank you to all three speakers. They kept uh, the time, 20 minutes. That's not so easy with this uh, tricky topic. And uh, now we were active here on the panel. Now it's on, it's, it's on you to have questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, please indicate uh, uh, whom you want to, to ask. So the floor is open for questions, please. Uh, maybe I start with a question uh, to all our three speakers. Um, we, we, sp we are speaking about refugee policies. And uh, this is a very, uh, it's, a, it's an, a theme that's very important in our times. We also have a refugee crisis in our times. How can you com compare the refugee crisis uh, during the World War II and the refugee crisis of today? What is the difference and what is uh, the commonalities? What do you think? Can you start? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I've indicated already in my talk a little bit what, what are the parallels of the uh, refugee crisis that is uh, even at least in recent times uh, there's this, um, um, the reaction is to uh, get, the reaction, the reaction is getting back to uh, nationalistic, uh, attitude towards the refugee crisis, which I think is uh, problematic if you compare it to the, um, uh, to the situation in the 1930s. Uh, so there is um, actually, I think today is more international coordination, but the motivation uh, is still a nationalistic one, which is uh, more or less the same like in the 1930s, although there is more, uh, you know, uh, common effort to come to an agreement uh, uh, how to address this crisis. Mm -hmm. So, please. So, I, I guess this is the, the central question, yeah, what we can draw from, from the 1930s and 40s to today. And so, you know, I, I'm mindful of, of the challenges of making direct comparisons, but I, I'm also very appreciative of the fact that this conference has been organized, that we can think about what we can learn from history. This is why I hope we do what we do. And so a few of, of the points that I've been thinking about working on this relevant to the present day, the one is, as I think I tried to make clear from in my presentation, that it's always important to bear in mind the perspective of the refugees um, and the experience of statelessness. And as we heard last night, the years and years in which it takes for that stateless condition to be resolved and the impact that it has subsequently on those communities, uh, both politically, culturally, socially. Uh, one thing that becomes clear is that uh, the international community it has not figured out a way to resolve the problem of statelessness. That is that we are organized according to, as Susanna was pointing out, according to this nation state system and we tend to fall back on uh, uh, on nationalism and erecting strong boundaries and that uh, of course as we see in the situation of the refugees it is the the people who fall in between the cracks of this system that we are not uh, adequately equipped ever to to address and to respond to and so we can look at it historically we can see that again in the 1930s and 1940s uh, as countries erected their boundaries and their barriers it was the people who fell in between the cracks that, uh, you know, we, as I alluded to at the end, and as I think we'll, we'll see in the post-war panel, this is where I think Zionism emerges as a solution to the refugee crisis from the Jewish perspective, at least for uh, a large percentage of the Jewish DPs, because Zionism ends up solving the problem of statelessness for the Jews, um, and, and that's an important response in the post-war period. Two, two other points that I'll make is that one other thing that we can see here is as the crisis grows uh, for, throughout the course of the 1930s and then with the outbreak of the war and then with the uh, knowledge of the final solution, we always are only motivated to action in a crisis. Uh, and we can see this constantly and, and usually by then it's, it's too late so um, to mo marshal any sort of effective response. And yet 
uh, this seems to be the sort of recurring theme throughout history. I'll leave it there. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, even the position for the Holy See, because I will speak only for that kind. I think the uh, situation isn't changed a lot. I mean, the actual pontiff speaks out, uh, makes also clear what the position of the Holy See is on this issue and was in this issue, and it didn't change. Um, of course, the situation is changed. Uh, we're talking about um, many refugees. Africa is a, is, a, is a region with particular problems. Uh, when then we have these refugees in Europe, which is another problem, and which is related to also religious, um, let's say, affected sentiment in Europe. Um, so uh, to deal with it, uh, it's not up to us historians to, to do that. But anyway, what I can say is that I think that uh, at least uh, the Holy See continues to do what they did before. And also our representatives in different countries, if you see, they don't leave the post if they don't have to, uh, forced by the country where they uh, accredited. Uh, mostly they leave uh, only in, in, in extreme situations. But uh, if you see that also with the invasion of Iraq and everything, the, the, the nuncio remained where he was just to find these little corridors, you know, of negotiation, of speaking with uh, the local authorities to find solutions for the people, the people that are suffering. And uh, I think on this part, nothing changed, for the Holy See at least. So I was aware that there in the first row is a question. The microphone is also here. Uh, thank Please you. Uh, my name is Santo de Bernardini. I'm the head of the Italian delegation to IRA. Um, a question which is prompted by uh, the uh, intervention by Dr. Heim. Uh, in uh, uh, your presentation, I got the feeling that there was some conceptual confusion in the way in which uh, Western government reacted to the problem of uh, Jewish refugees. On the one hand, they recognized that uh, it was a political reason for, that created this problem. On the other hand, uh, they uh, uh, tackled the issue also from the viewpoint of the capacity of absorption of their labor market of these uh, uh, refugees. So on the one hand it was a political, on the other hand it was uh, uh, economic. Uh, so th this confusion between uh, po political refugees and uh, economic migration, was, was really such a confusion or there was a more clear approach? And the second point concerning the Avian Conference, if my recollection are, are good enough, uh, um, it seems to me that one of the delegates in Evian uh, said more or less, uh, uh, I'm lucky enough to be from a country that does not have the problem of anti-Semitism because we have not Jews and I don't want to create uh, an anti-Semitic problem also in my country by importing Jews. Uh, such a consideration was uh, uh, really, uh, uh, played really a role in the fact that the Evian conference uh, did not uh, have any, any concrete uh, uh, result, any concrete uh, response to uh, the problem of the Jewish refugees. Yeah, thank you for this question. You know, first to the um, um, letter, uh, confusion between political reasons and economic reasons. Um, I think, um, actually, I don't think it was really, really a confusion, but uh, of course, everybody argued with economic reasons and with a, a limited uh, capacity of absorption of refugees due to the, uh, uh, to the economic crisis, the uh, world inco global economic crisis. But this is always a kind of, um, uh, you know, a very weak criteria whom you can, uh, can get in uh, and on which level. Uh, 
Of course, there was kind of an economic dimension of the problem because the Germans stripped the Jews uh, of their properties and uh, made them leave the country more or less penniless. This really impeded their re-establishment in exile. And of course, to resettle uh, large uh, groups of Jews somewhere else, uh, you need money for, yeah? So uh, they really shifted the problem to the uh, receiving countries. But in these countries, uh, it was quite clear that there was also kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the negative reaction was due to the fact that most of these refugees were also uh, were Jews. So uh, they didn't speak about it, and uh, and even, for instance, the, um, uh, the committee with uh, advisory co uh, committee. Uh, for president of President Roosevelt for the uh, refugees, never spoke about Jewish refugees, but about political refugees in order to disguise that we were talking about Jews. The same at the Evian conference, where we never mentioned the Jews, but only political refugees. Uh, but, you know, as you mentioned, the, uh, the reaction of the delegate uh, from Australia who said, uh, we don't have a, a race problem and we don't want to import one. Yeah? This was the only one who clearly addressed what many other uh, delegates were thinking as well. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to draw a clear line between uh, political and economic reasons, but behind the scene there was also this, uh, the, uh, the fear of the, of the delegates in Evian and the fear of the politicians in all these receiving countries that taking in refugees was um, uh, unpopular and taking in Jews was even more unpopular. Um, so, and uh, did I answer more or less what you say? Okay, thank you. Do you want that the others also or it was addressed only to her? So. Uh, yes, another question there in the middle. Um, Carl Bontempo at SUNY Albany. So it seems to me that one of the implications of the panel is that an effective response in the 30s and early 40s would have involved all three of these entities in some sort of coordinated fashion. And so I'm wondering if you could address the efforts that were made, for instance, between the national right, uh, responses that you outlined, Dr. Hyman, and then the, the ones that you outlined, Dr. Pat, at the, at the NGO international organization level, uh, the, the, the barriers to, to actual um, uh, interaction between the national and the uh, NGO side of things, and even we can add in the Holy See into this. So how much, how much interaction was there between each of these three groups in trying to solve these problems? And if there was not, why not? And then the second part of that is it strikes me that a similar uh, uh, dynamic is at work today, right? That requires some sort of interactive, uh, coordinated effort between national governments, international organizations. Mm. And are there any lessons from the 30s about how that interaction went that might influence today's policymakers and thinkers as they confront refugee crises? Thanks. Yes, I think this question is uh, posed to uh, uh, everybody. So can you start? You want me to start? Interaction. Sure. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's, it's an excellent question. I think it's right to the heart of the matter. Um, I'll, I'll focus specifically on the perspective here in this case of, of the Jewish organizations um, and their, their uh, role and responsibility vis-a-vis -vis their respective governments. And I guess one of the points that comes out is, uh, as you can see from the divisions that exist between, uh, specifically, what's fascinating to me is the Joint and the World Jewish Congress. So the JDC is an American Jewish organization. The World Jewish Congress is an overarching uh, sort of world body that's only formed in 1936. And it's internal Jewish politics that prevents them really from working together. The joint looks at them as a relative newcomer. The joint thinks of themselves as solely responsible for organizing relief. And they really wanted to be the organization that was 
uh, coordinating relief efforts. And so I think they resented the arrival of the World Jewish Congress on the scene. I didn't have time to talk about it, but the World Jewish Congress organizes out of their offices in Geneva also remarkable efforts, uh, uh, something called the Relief Company, Relico, uh, the work of Alfred Silbershine. Uh, but the problem gets down to a political one, and I think this has something to do with uh, the relationships between all these organizations. The joint does not want to be perceived as taking a political viewpoint. They want to be seen as nonpartisan, apolitical. And the World Jewish Congress espouses more or less a Zionist uh, viewpoint. Um, and so this complicates efforts, and it also complicates the standing of the JDC in the United States. One of the complexities of the JDC, in 1939 and 1940, uh, the United States is not in the war. There is, however, a sort of pressure for a boycott of Germany, so this complicates uh, sending uh, supplies to, to Nazi Germany at the time. And then after, after the war breaks out, the JDC office in Warsaw that had been receiving relief and supplies from the United States is now essentially shut down after 1940. Uh, they keep working throughout the war period and uh, providing relief in the Warsaw Ghetto, but uh, actually they end up having to uh, take loans from wealthier Jews who are in Warsaw with a promise of paying them back at the end of the war. And all of this is because of international uh, embargoes and boycotts and difficulty of transferring funds, which is to say that, to get back to your question, there is division within the Jewish organizations, there's division within the Jewish community, there's the complexity of the international relations, and there's no capacity for working together in any effective way. Yes. First, I have to uh, say that whereas the Catholic Church holds charity in its genetic code, and the Holy See in itself, uh, at the contrary, is not a charitable organization. It was never the idea in the Holy See to uh, equiparate uh, itself to international organizations of any kind. Uh, and however, its own traditions and its position in the situation of the Second World War changed, of before the Second World War already changed a lot, uh, the situation for the Holy See. Uh, it places itself above all conflicts, uh, but the situation before the war and during the war, as I say, changed it and granted her a particular obligation and a unique possibility also. And I say this because uh, in that what we just heard uh, there was a great uh, dif difficulty in fact to reach let's say cooperation on the international field. I must say that the Holy See, if you see the, the files at least already available but also those I have seen during the war by the preparation of the files of Pius XII, uh, we can say that the Holy See, in fact, is, is in that case um, extraordinary um, an outsider because they are working with several organizations all over the world continuously. And um, they have, for instance, I didn't mention them, but uh, in Fribourg there was the Mission Catholic Suisse, which was very active. Yeah? And they were collaborating, of course, with the Red Cross who was, had to see in Switzerland also. And in Germany itself uh, was active the Raphaelsverein, uh, which was an organization um, directed by the Palatine Fathers, very active. Uh, and for the Jewish refugees, uh, we were working together as a Holy See with the Catholic Committee of Refugees in Utrecht, in Holland. And also, of course, with the Catholic uh, Committee for Refugees of Germany in Washington. Um, I must say that the refugee problem, as I said already, it was a, can sound odd, but it was an opportunity for the Holy See. And I see that also in the, th in the political you know, evolution uh, of Pacelli himself, who before the war already believes 
that the only solution will be lifting up the policy making between the states to another level, namely an international level, and it's the beginning of thinking about the United Nations. And in that uh, topic, he found, of course, a partner in the President of America. Uh, let's say, in, in, on, 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 on a very theoretical basis. But uh, for, uh, I must say that uh, I see that in, in, in this thinking of the future Pope, uh, he was aware already before the war we have to lift up all the problematics of uh, all the problems, in fact, we are facing to another level. Uh, because, in fact, nationalities and regional and ethnical groups are uh, obstacles, in fact, in, let's say, cooperation, international cooperation, or for cooperation. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, looking at the interaction of these three uh, groups, I think the, the, this makes the picture even... Uh, more set as it is anyway, <laughs> because uh, you know um, I think there was not much uh, cooperation, but sometimes even uh, they worked against each other. Uh, uh, let me first address the, the level of the uh, NGOs, the, uh, the Jewish organizations. Uh, you know they, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, they. Uh, they carry the main burden to deal with the refugees on the, uh, on the level of uh, housing them and feeding them. Uh, but uh, they tried, for instance, to use this international level like the, uh, the League of Nations and the High Commission of the League of Nations to, uh, to act as a, or to use it as a substitute for a state they were missing. And so they were quite willing to uh, financed this uh, high commissioner and to really to engage in this institution of a high commissioner but uh, somehow I would say they were functionalized by the states who pushed the financial burden to the Jewish organization or organizations and didn't even listen to them uh, when they had uh, when they made their proposals how to solve the refugee crisis and especially for instance at the co uh, co uh, at the conference of Avion they were, there were uh, several Jewish institutions who didn't speak with one voice, as, as we have heard, but uh, they were uh, heard only by the subcommittees and were not invited to, uh, you know, to take part in the conference as uh, one party of the, uh, of the conference, like the, uh, the delegates of the states. Uh, the, with them, so they were somehow you know, yeah, fun functionalized by the, by the nation states, I think. And um, the Catholic Church, uh, I think uh, their, um, their problem was that they didn't grab the, uh, the specificity of, um, uh, of the Jewish problem in the whole scene because they saw the Catholic Church to be attacked by the Nazis as well and uh, Catholics uh, being persecuted as well and you know if you look at what uh, for instance Pater Oro the representative of the Vatican said at the Avion conference it was more or less you know the Jews are quite uh, powerful they can defend themselves we have to look after our people and so the, uh, the uh, uh, church addressed more or cared more or less uh, mainly about the, the, those Jews who converted to Catholicism, which was even more than what the, uh, what the Lutheranian church did. They uh, even distanced themselves to those Jews uh, who, um, who had adopted um, Lutheranian um, faith and, uh, uh, and regarded them, or large parts of the official church regarded them still as Jewish, uh, Jews and were not very uh, you know, didn't, uh, were, were not very helpful for them. So I think, uh, yeah, the, the misery was that all these actors against, uh, acted, uh, in many respects, acted against each other, although I think on a, on a low level there was a lot of um, help and uh, solidarity uh, to deal with the problem, you know, to hide Jews, for instance, in monaster monasteries or to uh, uh, to issue false, forged papers for them and so on. Uh, we know about certain consuls who acted in a different way and helped Jews. Or, and uh, you know many individual 
uh, priests who helped Jews and hide, uh, hide, uh, to go in, into hiding, but you know, on an official level, I think it was actually a disaster. So we have only three, four minutes. We have two questions, uh, please here, and the two questions together, and then indicate to whom and be brief with the question and the answer. Here, first here and then there. Thank you so much. My name is Jean Santer. I'm the Luxembourg ambassador to Berlin, uh, delegate to Ireland, former ambassador to the Holy See. Um, yes, I would like to ask a question to Dr. X, if he would allow. Um, I was very much impressed by the list of actions he has given, uh, actions by the Vatican uh, done during the highlight of the crisis uh, in the late 1930s and 40s. There was also a list of uh, um, people he mentioned, dignitaries, that had intervened. Now, the, this conference is not uh, the cadre, the context, to analyze whether these people have done only, let's say, actions in one side or are more, let's contest it for other actions. My point is a different one. As a Catholic, we still are very often confronted in the media, in the science world, with the clear action of the Vatican. Now, you hinted two, at two points. First, there must have been discretion at the time, silence. You hinted also at the fact that there will be some positive surprises if the archives will be made public. My question relates to the publication uh, uh, and the making public of the action, as I said, from a practicing, practicing Catholic point of view, we all would feel relieved if there would be a more active, perhaps, going around the action and the publication of the action of, at that period. Okay. Two, two sentences. Mm. What can I say? I, I'm in favor of opening the archives today, uh, but uh, it must be possible. I mean, there are technical reasons, obviously, uh, that should be uh, uh, ready uh, and, and, and settled. Um, the silence and discretion is obvious. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a long, long discussion going on uh, on this silence of Pius XII, and it's not Pius XII, it was the whole his staff who was silenced. And they did well. I mean, <laughs> If, I don't know if we, we really, you know, can imagine what it was living under dictature of Nazism and Bolshevism. People who did it, they know that, you know, uh, every action that you did in the public was, was uh, a death sentence uh, in, in one day, in, in, in a way. So I think we, we have to also see it of that respect and then also the, there are di diplomats in the first way. And I think all the diplomats here together will agree that they are not talking about what they are doing. I mean, uh, it's something in the diplomatic world, in the diplomatic world that, uh, you know, it's not done. Uh, so uh, in that respect, I would reconsider, let's say, the silence. But uh, I, I think that the time is too short to, to go into these uh, discussions. I mean, they are too... Um, so I think a brief question and a brief answer, then we finish <laughs> yes, the session. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, the Belgian ambassador to the Holy See. I have a question on um, the attitude of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, saw, I see no figures appear on the number of refugees uh, taken by the Soviet Union, and I'm speaking of before the Pact uh, um, um, Ribbentrop-Molotov, but in Soviet Union, ther theoretically, uh, there was a regime based on international socialism, international fraternity. Did the Soviet Union accept uh, a few uh, Ref Jewish uh, refugees? Uh, yeah, actually uh, only a very few ones. 
uh, because you know the, uh, the official reason given for this is that the refugee crisis is a capitalist crisis and has to be solved by capitalist countries. But of course they uh, accepted uh, Jews who were uh, communists and uh, had a certain uh, position in, uh, in the communist movement and uh, decided for political reasons to go to the Soviet Union. So, uh, but the official uh, attitude of the Soviet Union in these early years uh, was that, you know, it was not their problem. I'll just, sorry, I'll, I know we have to wrap up, but I'll just jump in and add one point, which is I think this is very important and it, it needs further research because we know that large numbers of refugees who did flee to the east, I showed you the Lithuania, or those who flee into what is the Soviet Union are then deported further to the east, and that is actually what saves a large number of, of Jews during the war. So you have uh, Jewish refugees who end up in Central Asian republics and Tashkent and, and Samarkand and elsewhere. And at the end of the war, coming back to the DP camps, it's these Jews who are repatriated who end up forming the vast majority of what we would call survivors who are... So there is a story there that has yet to be written about sort of Soviet policy and, and the sheltering refugees and the aid organizations that are able to get relief into the Soviet Union. Uh, but we don't... It hasn't been written yet, so. So, uh, we are at the end of this uh, panel, so thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to you for the questions. And we